Just kidding. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Matt Roloffs. I'm the chair of the Department of Economics here at Western Washington University. And on behalf of the Paul Storer Memorial Fund, our department, our co-sponsors from the Departments of Sociology, the Center for Canadian American Studies, the Border Policy Research Institute, and the WWU Alumni Association, I'd like to welcome you today to the 2023 Paul Storer Memorial Lecture featuring Dr. Irene Bloomrad of the University of California at Berkeley. I'd like to start by, uh, I'd like to begin by reading our tribal land statement and acknowledging that we gather today on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish peoples who have lived in the Salish Sea Basin throughout the San Juan Islands and the North Cascades watershed from time immemorial. Please join me in expressing our, deep, our deepest respect and gratitude for our indigenous neighbors, the Lummi Nation and Nooksack tribe for their enduring care and protection of our shared lands and waterways. A bit of housekeeping before we dive in, we've allocated maybe 45 minutes, 50, something like that today for the lecture. Uh, and then Dr. Bloomrad has agreed, uh, graciously agreed, to answer your questions, engage in some conversation with you uh, during our Q&A. We received a few questions in advance. Uh, for, and for those of you in the room, I'll have this mic. I'll wander around in case you have a question that you would like to ask. Um, if you're joining us via the webinar, uh, you can use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. Uh, my colleague Jason Query over here is going to monitor those questions uh, and we'll kind of work them into the Q&A as we go. Before I bring up Scott Young, the Dean of the College, to introduce our speaker, I'd like to say a few words about the reason that we're here today, and that's to honor and continue the work of our dear friend and colleague, Dr. Paul Storer. It's wonderful to see many of Paul's Western colleagues here with us today, and I'm glad to welcome many of Paul's family and friends with us via the webinar as well. It's good to have you all here. Paul earned his BA and MA degrees in economics at the University of Toronto and his PhD in economics from the University of Western Ontario. After spending time working at the Bank of Canada and teaching at the University of Quebec in Montreal, Paul and his family, his wife Tina, their children Leah and Nick, moved to Bellingham in 1996. At Western, Paul established himself as a respected teacher, scholar, and for many of us in the room, a leader and a mentor. Paul taught courses in macro, money and banking, labor economics, and Canadian economic policy, and the business and economic relations between the US and Canada. His research focused on these issues as well and worked with the Border Policy Research Institute and longtime collaborators such as Dr. St Stephen Globerman produced widely cited and influential research. Paul was a five-time recipient of the CBE Dean's Research Award and was recognized in 2004 with the University's Excellence in Teaching Award. He served as the editor of the Northwest Journal of Business and Economics from 2001 to 2005, as a valuable member of the board of the Pacific Northwest Regional Economic Conference, or PENREC, for many years, and as our department chair from 2007 to 2013. The department, the university, and the discipline were all deeply changed for the better through Paul's dedication and efforts, and we miss him a great deal. The Paul Story Memorial Fund was established in Paul's honor in 2016. The purpose of the fund is twofold. First, to support and present an annual lecture on the state of Canada-US business and economic relations. And second, to support students in attendance at the PENREC. We've distributed flyers around the room today that share more about Paul's legacy in the fund, including details on how you can contribute if you would like. Now to introduce our speaker today, I'd like to invite Dr. Scott Young, Dean of the College of Business and Economics to the podium. Nobody clapped. Come on. <laughs> What's up with you guys? <laughs> All right. So uh, thanks for coming, everyone, faculty, staff, and students, um, and online on the webinar. So for today's lecture, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Irene Bloomrad. Rad. Uh, she's the class of 1951 professor of sociology at the University of California and the founding director of Berkeley's Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative. She also serves as a Thomas Garden uh, Barnes Chair of Canadian Studies at Berkeley and is co-director of the Boundaries Membership and Belonging Program of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Irene has co-authored or co-edited five books, including the Oxford Handbook of Citizenship, Rallying for Immigration Rights, 
and becoming a citizen. In 2014, 2015, she served as a member of the US National Academy of Sciences panel reporting on the integration of immigrants into US society. And in 2018, the leading North American migration journal, International Migration Review, named her its featured scholar of the year. Dr. Bloomrad believes that excellence in research and teaching go hand in hand and has been honored with multiple teaching and mentorship awards. We're honored to have Irene with us today to present her lecture titled, Why Canadians Mostly Love Immigration and Americans Aren't So Sure. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Irene Bloomrad. Thank you. All right, let's see. Oh, okay, sorry. No, I'm sorry. I was too quick. No, I forgot to do that. Awesome. Yeah. And the Zoom people are seeing the right screen, hopefully. If anyone's, yes, if we are. are. Okay, awesome. <laughs> you know, we've only been doing this for three years and we still have trouble with technology, at least I do sometimes. Um, thank you very much um, for coming out today, for those of you here in person, and thank you for those online. Uh, this is my first time to the University of Western Washington. I was saying that if I'd known how easy it was to fly from Oakland to Bellingham, this would not have been my first time. I would have certainly uh, made the trip earlier. Um, but I feel like I know the university just a little bit. Uh, my former program manager at Canadian Studies at UC Berkeley, Elliot Smith, is an alum of uh, U Western Washington and got his master's degree in Canadian Studies. And he always spoke with incredible affection for Bellingham, for the university, and especially for the Canadian American Studies program. Um, so it's, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here. And I thank all of the sponsors um, who uh, invited me here. I have to say that when I got the invitation, I uh, was a little bit taken aback because I was like, well, I'm not an economist and I don't do trade. Um, I know something about Canada and the United States, but are you sure you really want me? Um, and I was told yes. And, and I hope that I can at least honor Paul Storer's memory. I did not have the honor of um, knowing him. Um, but I do want to talk a lot about the border and migration and maybe um, humans and human beings as part of the economic equation. So that's sort of my entry point uh, to this. Now, hopefully everyone sees this billboard on top of my head. This is just one example of multiple billboards that you could have seen uh, over the last, I would say, seven, eight, nine years, if you're driving between San Francisco and SFO, so the airport in Silicon Valley. Um, these billboards are attempting, in various forms or shapes, to convince people in the United States to migrate to Canada. And they tend to all have a tech focus. Uh, so here you can see they're actually appealing to immigrants currently living in the United States who are concerned, what if my visa gets canceled, but also Americans, what if I lose my job and lose my health insurance? Um, and so appealing to the idea of you might want to migrate to Canada. Now this one, is paid for by communitech.ca, which is a nonprofit or sort of a, a it's, it's basically, it's not entirely clear if it, they're incorporated as a nonprofit or something else, but um, the website will tell you that it's a group of tech entrepreneurs who have come together in order to encourage people to come up to Canada and do their tech entrepreneurship up in Canada. Um, but billboards like this have also been paid directly by the government of Canada. And if you scratch the surface of this organization, you'll find that they are funded partially by the government of Canada and the government of Ontario. So there is deep government uh, involvement in trying to get people to migrate. Now, um, just last week, actually, the World Bank didn't quite do the same thing, but was also promoting migration as an economic strategy. Uh, so last week, the World Bank uh, Development Group put out its flagship world development report. Um, and the focus for 2023 was migrants, refugees, and societies. 
Um, this is a bunch of economists working at the World Bank who are going to talk about or, or basically make the argument for why we have to consider migration as part of an economic development strategy. Um, just some of their messages to get you a sense of how they're thinking about migration in an economic context. Uh, one of the first things they point out, which I think many people do when they're thinking about migration and economic development or economics in general, are population pyramids, right? Dem demographic population pyramids. Here, the top one is of Italy and the one below it is Mexico. The upshot for both of these is whether you're looking at rich countries or actually most middle income countries, there is slowly but surely going to be a decline, or there already has been in the Italian case, of fertility for women. And so there are far fewer than two children being born to each woman. And as a result, we are getting an older and older population. One quick webinar okay. thing. <laughs> One quick webinar thing. Yes. Pause. Reflect on demo demographics. <laughs> <laughs> awesome people were watching my notes is that there <laughs> it's all right i can see my notes then um so the the issue here is you know that we're getting fewer and fewer people being born in many rich countries and medium income countries maybe not a problem if you're looking at housing prices maybe we want fewer people if we're thinking about climate change maybe having fewer people is not a bad thing for the planet in terms of resources but from an economic perspective in terms of growth and in terms of paying for an aging population, especially their pensions and their health care, this is a problem. And so the World Bank points out that uh, we need to basically reallocate people from the few countries where you still have more than two children being born per woman to the countries where we are lacking young people. Right. So the World Bank comes at this from a very sort of human capital demographic perspective. Let's see. Um, beyond that, they also say that uh, migration is useful for migrants. It is a poverty alleviation strategy. Previous reports of the UN, for example, have said that if people move from a country that's lower on a human development index to a country that's just even a little bit higher on a human development index, incomes can double, triple, education can increase multiple, multiple years, and mortality decreases for children. So there is real effects for migration when you go from low HDI countries to higher HDI countries. We also see that it is a good way to get remittances. So the origin countries gain capital uh, in terms of financial remittances. And the argument has been that in general for the destination countries, including rich countries, there are all kinds of benefits from migration, be it via the labor market, fiscal contributions, as well as higher productivity, lower prices for goods and services. And then in a place like Silicon Valley, they will inevitably point out that if you look at the proportion of people who found big tech companies or even small startups, the proportion of immigrants leading those companies is far higher than the proportion in the general population. So immigrants bring creativity and innovation. So the World Bank notes some problems with migration, but generally is very positive. This is an economic development strategy. It's a win-win-win for everybody. Um, so that's what the economists think, or at least some economists, most economists, I would say. Uh, the demographers think this. Uh, public opinion, not so sure. Right. If you ask the general population, should we have more immigration? The general answer is no. Um, so here, this is just a number of different countries from the Pew Research uh, 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 surveys. And the red is people saying that they want fewer or even no migration whatsoever. So combining people who say, I want fewer migrants into my country or no migration. And the green is the, the proportion of people who say they want more migrants. And you can see that in places like Israel and Italy, the vast majority of people are uninterested in any more migration. In fact, they would like none. And the only country here where you have people, and even then it's like only you know, 22, 23% who say they want more is in Japan compared to those who say they want fewer or none. The missing category here, you're probably thinking this doesn't add up to 100. Uh, the missing category is people who say what we have right now is just fine. So the missing is just like, keep it as it is right now. Now, in the Japanese case, some of you might know, 
there is almost no migration to Japan. It's, it's a very, very small proportion um, relative to many other rich countries. So it's maybe not surprising that in Japan, people are like, yeah, we should get some more immigration because there is not very much to start with. You could argue that in Italy, Italy is actually one of the major countries receiving a lot of unauthorized uh, migration or refugee and asylees across the Mediterranean. So perhaps not surprising that you would imagine that Italians are like, oh, you know, maybe we have a little bit too much. Um, but generally speaking, regardless of which country you're looking at, and it can be a high income country or middle income country, the general public is not very excited about immigration. And I think the US would probably fit more or less in this. So now I want to focus into North America, and I want to think about what's going on in the North American context. And sort of as background for this World Development Report, I and a number of colleagues from the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research were asked to do a background paper for the World Bank on the social inclusion and social implications of immigration, because they were struck by this very dilemma, I guess, from an economist perspective, right? So from their analysis economically, migration is good. So many people don't want it. What's going on? Um, so I'm going to be speaking a little bit to that and then some of my other research's background. Um, Matt said that I was going to sp speak for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes. I'm happy to take clarifying questions as we go. This is just, just me talking to you is a little bit um, intimidating, to be honest. So feel free to raise a hand or, or ask. Um, so the puzzle is, you know, what, what is going on in terms of public opinion? And then let's look at Canada and the U.S. to think about managing migration and especially migration as economic strategy potentially. So I want you all to cast your minds in the past pre-COVID, and I'm going to take you back to 2015 and 2016. 2015 in Canada, there's a federal election. The prime minister in power at the time is Stephen Harper of the Conservative Party. Uh, Justin Trudeau is running for office from the Liberal Party, um, and this is his first time running as head of the Liberal Party. Um, this is when the Syrian refugee crisis is at its height. Uh, there is massive millions of people or over a million people moving into Europe at this time. And uh, Justin Trudeau says, we are going to take some of these Syrians who are fleeing their homeland he makes this part of his campaign. We are going to welcome in 25,000 Syrians. It ends up being 35,000 and, you know, tweeting about welcome to Canada. So he's going to make this part of his campaign. 2016, here in the United States, another, pres another sort of leader of a political party is running for office. He too makes immigration sort of the center of his campaign in a very different direction, right? So Donald Trump, um, campaigns on a complete shutdown of Muslim migration, so no interest in resettling Syrian migrants, and in fact, shutting the border down entirely. Both of them win, right? And so this is pretty remarkable. You have a, a prime minister in Canada who ran on opening the door to refugees and migration. You have a presidential candidate in the United States who runs on closing the door. Both of them win. But we're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a sort of continent where migration has been part of its history, both in Canada and the United States, and they're both facing potentially similar issues of can migration be a development strategy or at least an economic strategy. So I want to think through why is there this difference sort of politically and in terms of public opinion. Now, um, the economist reflecting, this is from the economist, the economist reflecting on this distinction, you know, has this really... I don't know, it's a pretty poignant kind of caricature, I guess, of like the difference in terms of the two countries that share a border. Um, but if you also look at survey research, you find that there is a difference between the two countries and it's, it's significant. It's not quite as big as that contrast between Trudeau and Trump really seems to suggest, but there is a difference. So um, ask this question, we must close our border to refugees entirely. We can't accept any back in 2017. Only a quarter of Canadians say yes. Though alternatively, you can say one in four, to, one in four Canadians do say yes. They'd want to shut the border to refugees. But in the United States, it's almost half, right? So there is a difference here. This would be the first year of the Trump presidency. And then asked whether there are too many immigrants in our country. About a third of Canadians do agree with this back in 2017. In the US, it's half. 
So again, this perception in the United States that there's just too many immigrants or we should at least slow down our immigration policy. Now, what's really interesting in the Canadian case, and I think is, is a real puzzle when you compare Canada to other countries, is that in the Canadian case, there's actually been increasing support of immigration over time. So if we think about the last 10, 20, even maybe 30 years of increasing populism, especially anti-immigrant populism in France and Sweden, in potentially the United States, Canada has been um, on a different trajectory. So this comes from Enveronics. Let me just um, take just a second to explain the, the lines because it's a little bit counterintuitive. So the question asked to survey respondents is, do you strongly agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, strongly disagree with this statement? Overall, there is too much immigration in Canada. So the red line are people disagreeing there's too much immigration. So another way of thinking about that is the red line is actually showing support for immigration. They don't think it's too much. And you can see that up to about 2000, more people agreed that there was too much immigration to Canada. This was seen as a concern. And then around 2000, there's this flip up to the point where you have two thirds of respondents by, you know, in the last few years saying, no, no, it's not too much. And this is happening at a time when the Canadian federal government has recently announced increases to its immigration up to about 400, 500,000 people being let in every year. And the, and the numbers still just keep going up. Pretty remarkable. Um, another similar thing you see with refugees. So previously, and this is this has been more recent, but up to that election, that 2015 election of the Liberals, if people were asked whether there are too many people who claim to be refugees who are not refugees, like is this bogus, illegitimate refugees, back in the 80s, people were like, yes, these are bogus, illegitimate refugees, about 80% almost said that that was the case. And then slowly over time, people become more sympathetic to refugees, or at least more willing to believe that these are genuine refugee claims. This flips. And then more recently, we see much more e equal sort of opinion about whether they're bogus or they're genuine. But the general trend has been to believing that there might be a basis for a refugee claim. All right, US, we have a story of ambivalence. Through the 60s up to the 19, up to about 1992, according to Gallup, it is the case that the US, like Canada, gets increasingly worried about immigration. So here the question is, should immigration be kept at its present level, increased or decreased? The dashed line is the one that says decreased, right? So over the 70s and the 80s up to the mid 90s, Americans in general were saying, let's decrease immigration. Um, and for many of you here in the audience, you'll probably remember that sort of the mid 90s is when you have Prop 187 in California and you have a lot of activism around trying to deal with undocumented immigration on the California Mexico border around San Diego, for example, right? So we see this increase of concern. Then, since then, it's become highly partisan and very divided. And so you have somewhat of a similar decrease in terms of people being opposed to immigration as in Canada, but nowhere near the consensus on the Canadian side, right? So the Canadian side moves to a consensus of immigration is a positive thing. We, we, we support immigration. In the US, absolute division in terms of about a third of people saying, let's increase it. A third of people saying, no, let's decrease it. A third of people saying, I have no clue. Let's just keep it the way it is, right? So this is the situation that we have in the United States. Yes. A Zoom audience member would like to know if any of the support or lack of support has been broken down by regions within the country. Okay, so for those who might not have heard the question, the question is whether the support or lack of support um, has been broken down by region of the country in both the US and Canada, is that? Okay, so in the United States case, in the US case, it's certainly in the last 10 years, totally inflected by partisanship. So if you tell me, if you're a registered Democrat or Republican or independent, I can probably guess your opinion on immigration, though not perfectly. Um, so to the extent that we know that some parts of the country are more democratic leaning or Republican leaning, those two things overlap, um, but it's very much inflected by, by party politics. In the Canadian case, this is much less the case. And in fact, even under the Harper conservative government, um, there were, 
There were questions raised by the government around Muslim migration in part, but the actual number of migrants who are being let in has been largely a consensus across most of the major political parties. So you don't see that same partisanship. In terms of uh, differences across provinces, yes, there are differences, but it's very small. So we're talking two, three, four percentage points in general. Um, so depending on who asked the question, it's not the case that Quebec is totally different from the rest of Canada, nor is it the case that Alberta, for example, is totally different from the rest of Canada. Those, those always seem to be the two that <laughs> people talk about, right? Quebec and Alberta. Um, if, if you'll get to this in a second, um, I'm more familiar with the US kind of uh, visas and what's available in terms of immigration. Could you give us kind of a brief understanding of how the U.S. and Canada differ in in what they what they allow? What kind of yeah. So the, the question, again, for, for people on Zoom was um, to talk a little bit about the immigration policies of Canada and the United States. And absolute great question, because I'm going to get there in about two slides. So you're anticipating me. Thank you. Um, all right, so let's let's go. What explains the Canadian positive attitudes, right? Like what is going on? And this is a, a case, I think, of Canadian exceptionalism in a way, because the US is actually much more like many other countries. It's it's really Canada that's that's quite different. Now, I would say that the conventional political wisdom or the conventional sort of public wisdom is, well, when we see anti-immigrant attitudes, it's because there's a lot of immigrants, right? So if, Italy, if Italians are like saying, no, I don't want any more immigrants, it's because there's a lot of immigrants coming into Italy. Um, so a conventional view is we have hit our sort of level of tolerance in France. They talk about the sol de tolerance. And it's like, well, now we can't take any more. So, you know, we've, we've sort of done what we have to do. So a lot of people have spent time trying to correlate is the level of immigration correlated with attitudes is the increase in immigration correlated with attitudes absolute numbers um short answer no uh but let's dig into it just a little bit um all right let me let me take a pause here quiz for everyone here in person what proportion of the u.s population is foreign born which is going to be my proxy for immigrant 15. 15, 18, I heard. Seven. 7%. Seven Two. 10. Six. Six. You are an unusual audience. I'll just say that. When I usually ask this question, I did it today in, in uh, Pat's class, I usually get somewhere between 20 to 40%. Um, I get that all the time in California because it's California. So a lot of my students, they'll look around and they'll be like 25%, 30%, 40%. It's about 13 and a half percent. So 15 was pretty good. Um, according to the Ameri you know, the, the 2020 ACS, the American Community Survey, it was about 44 million people, 13.5% of the population. California is about 27%. I didn't look up what it was in Washington state. I don't even know. Do anyone know? No, Washington State. It's probably, probably, probably around thirteen. I would. I don't know. We'll have to. That'll have to be after after lecture conversation when we have our little reception. Um, so thirteen point five percent. Anyone want to give a guess about Canada? Percent of the population that is born born. <laughs> Someone knows his statistics. Yes, it's so. <laughs> This was this is from two this is from the OECD 2016, but it is actually 23% right now, according to Statistics Canada from 2021. There we go. Um, so you know, in Canada, there, there's far higher percentage of immigrants, yet Canadians remain very positive about immigration. And it's not just Canada and the US. There's actually, if you start trying to run a nice little regression correlation, or at least just even like just a a standard uh, correlation, you're gonna find that there's actually not much of a link between people's opinions on immigration and the actual proportion of immigrants or even the, the rate of change. The rate of change gets a little bit closer sometimes to fluctuations in terms of immigrant opinion, but it's not the case that people are just reacting because there's lots of immigrants. And then I just show this because um, when I speak to, especially people, um, the general public on immigration, 
Uh, the U.S. has such a storied history and sort of mythology about being an immigrant nation. But if you compare the United States to most European countries, it is no more special or different than most European countries when it comes to immigration. Um, so you're getting very similar proportions of foreign born individuals living in France, the Netherlands, the U.K., as you have in the United States. And so it, it just sort of shows that this is really a common experience now for most uh, high income countries. Um, and then and there's some countries that have just had dramatic changes. So like Ireland in particular, if you go back 20 years, about 2% of the Irish population was foreign born. And now it's like over 15 and growing. Um, another country that's in, like pretty spectacular on this, which is not on my graph here is Spain. Um, 30 years ago, it was also about two, 3%. Now it's also close to 20. So you see these dramatic changes in Europe. And I mentioned Ireland and Spain in particular, because neither of those two countries have had strong anti-immigrant politics, even though they have had the most rapid degree of change in their immigrant populations. But in this case, you're considering people born in other European countries than in this, right? Yes. So just like the yes, it could be. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, and then, you know, it's the same thing with the Canada-US statistics too. So my Canadian statistics on foreign born include US born. But yeah. Um, you know, like, so for, you can break it down to like non-Western, which is the way that the Europeans often do it. You're still getting pretty high numbers. All right. So if it's not the fact that, you know, the U.S. has lots of immigrants and that's why Americans are worried about immigration and Canadians are not, um, what might be some other reasons? One reason I do think matters, and this is something that people raise frequently, is just the geographic fortune of being really far from lots of different countries for the Canadians, right? So Canada is about 5,000 kilometers away from San Salvador. It's, you know, oh, oh, over 8,000 kilometers away from Aleppo, um, 11,000 kilometers away from Dhaka. So it's just really hard to get to Canada. So Canada does not face the same influxes of migration that you're seeing in Southern Europe, or along the southern border between the United States and Mexico, which drive sometimes populist or um, other concerns around migration. There's a sense of control that the Canadian government can really communicate to Canadians because of the benefits of geography. So this is a real benefit when you are a government trying to put together an immigration policy. Um, I would not though overstate completely how this geography plays into it, because I often think about the Australian case. In Australia, there's been a lot more vicious anti-immigrant politics than in Canada. And Australia is also somewhat hard to get to. Um, it is not the same as being on the other side of the Mediterranean or having you know, a 4,000 mile land border with Mexico. So even though Australians have the benefit of geography, they also have these politics of populism that Canada has so far at least largely avoided. So geography matters, sense of control matters, but it's not just that. So the second thing that people will often point out to when you're talking about sort of Canadian exceptionalism around immigration will be the economic selection policy. So this gets at your question in terms of how does immigration policy work in Canada? So this is another one of these billboards. I just love these billboards. Um, this one's from the Canadian government. You can see the Canadian government sign over on your left. Um, and this was, I don't remember when this was, this was about five, six years ago, pre-COVID. Um, so actually, it was probably under the Harper government. So it was probably at the very end of the Harper government. And it was trying to get these tech workers who might be having problems with their H-1B visas to go to Canada. So immigration policy in general usually goes into three buckets. And this is for Canada, the US, Sweden, France, Japan, you know, name your country. There's some kind of economic selection often, and this can be economic selection based on high skills, low skills, we need agricultural workers. It can be about investment. It can be like in Portugal, buy a house for a certain amount of money, and then we're gonna give you a visa. Um, another way to get into a country through an immigration track is family reunification. I'm married to someone who's a citizen of your country. Uh, it's my, you know, my, my child is sponsoring me, or I'm gonna sponsor my parents, maybe a brother or sister, et cetera. And then the last one is forced migration or humanitarian migration. So asylum seekers or refugee resettlement. Um, so the three main ways that we make selections are these three buckets. A fourth that some countries will do is selection based on 
some notion of ancestry. So you can think, for example, of Israel and the right to return for people of Jewish faith. So there's a selection based on some kind of uh, ancestry, ethnicity, et cetera. But generally speaking, most countries are no longer selecting on ancestry. So we can think of previously sort of racist policy in Canada and the United States that only some groups could come and other groups couldn't. Generally speaking today, it's these three buckets. All right. So in the Canadian case, when you're thinking of economic selection, family and humanitarian migration, overwhelmingly it's economic selection. And so this is epitomized in the idea of the point system. So people will talk about the point system. You get points for your uh, education, your language skills, the kind of work you do. And then once you get to a certain amount of points, you can then get in line through the immigration system. Family reunification is a smaller proportion, barely over a quarter. And at least at the time that I'm looking, this is the year before COVID really shut down migration, 16% um, were humanitarian migrants. So this would be people who are largely resettled refugees, but in some cases, asylum seekers who got um, their asylum claims adjudicated uh, in their favor, and they become um, part of uh, the humanitarian stream. In the United States, the system is overwhelmingly focused on family reunification. So unless you have a family member already living in the United States, your chances of getting into the United States through the legal immigration system is very, very small. Um, the economic system is heavily biased against people with limited education, heavily favors people with very high level skills and very sort of narrow set of skills. Um, Academics are privileged under this system. Um, so it's a little bit easier for academics to get through this system, but it also depends what country you come from because there's also a cap in terms of how many visas are given to various different countries. And so if you're from India, China, the Philippines or Mexico, you will be waiting for a very, very, very long time to come. You're much better off if you're from Malta or Iceland. Um, now the humanitarian in this year was um, not that, it was about 11%, but you can still see that the US in 2019 had about 100,000 people who got through humanitarian ways. So the Canadian system is really economically focused. And just to give you another sense of this, this was also back from 2019. If you went to the website of immigration and refugees, um, they would tell you all the different programs that are available for you to immigrate to Canada. And like these stars give you all the economic selection programs. Right, they're all variations on economic selection programs. Um, you know, some of them are for students who are going to transfer to a legal status. Some of them are for healthcare workers. There's an agri-food pilot, so this is for more low-skilled people who are working in agriculture or in factories that are processing agriculture. There are all kinds of visa categories for people willing to go to rural areas or far northern areas to the Atlantic provinces, which are losing population. You know, the astounding thing is like the Canadian government just keeps making up all of these new programs to just attract people through this economic selection. So this is really the, the focus of it. Um, and so, you know, when people talk about Canada's immigration system and why people have positive views, they usually say, well, there's not a lot of undocumented immigration. Canada is geographically isolated. There's control and there's an economic selection procedure. That is why Canadians like immigration. What I'd like to do as a sociologist, as a non an economist, is go a little bit beyond the conventional wisdom, and this is based on my research, um, give you some arguments for why, in addition, there are other reasons why it's been successful so far. And this has more to do with civil society um, as well as sort of imagines, imagination or imaginings of the national identity. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to is public-private partnerships for integration. In the United States, Immigration policy is basically restricted to border enforcement or the selection according to who can enter. But once you enter the country, with the exception of some resettled refugees, you get no additional assistance, right? And think about this even for the economists in the room, like what that means in terms of helping people potentially find jobs, helping them to invest, helping them to figure out housing markets and such. It's really pull yourself up by the bootstraps, you know, go ask your family members who sponsored you, figure it out yourself. That, that is largely the system. In the Canadian system, there is a whole set of different policies 
that the government funds, either from the federal government or in various cases, provincial and municipal governments, so that you can learn English or French in Quebec, um, that you can get job skills, et cetera. And so the Canadian government in its annual reports will very proudly tell you how many people have received at least one settlement service in every fiscal year. Um, and so you can see, remember, Canada is letting in about 300, 350,000 immigrants. So you're getting most people probably touching at least one settlement service in their first or second year. Um, not everybody, but many, many people. And the estimate is that there's about 550 nonprofits across the country that have been have received grants in order to provide these settlement services. So in some of my research, I sort of look at what the effects of this are. One thing that happens is that people get direct material assistance through these community-based organizations, which then sets them up for more success later on. So part of what is probably successful in the Canadian system is that people are not just sort of left to themselves in a laissez-faire, pull yourself up by the bootstrap system, and they're getting some assistance with language learning, they're getting some assistance with job placement, et cetera. The second thing though that happens is these civic infrastructures do become an advocacy network for immigrants, right? Because obviously these nonprofits are benefiting from their contracts, they're in conversation with the immigrant community, and they act as sort of uh, spokespeople or like at least an intermediary where you have immigrants who probably don't speak, might or might not speak English or French coming in. They go to the community-based organizations. Those community-based organizations can then lobby with, interact with, discuss with government officials. And so you have sort of a pipeline back and forth. And then when things, uh, when at least the community organizations feel like things aren't going their way, they will maybe take to the streets a little bit more, do letter writing campaigns and such. But they also generate down from the community-based organizations to immigrants sort of a sense of like, Canada cares about you. The government cares about you. We want you to be part of here. And so you get a little bit more, at least in, in some of the research I've done in Toronto and Boston, a sense of community and care that goes back and forth. So there's both the material benefits of the nonprofit, public partner, private ship, but there's also sort of symbolic or um, inclusive and belonging benefits that you get from this system. The second area where they do public and private partnerships um, is in refugee resettlement. So starting with the Indochinese uh, influx of refugees, mostly Vietnamese in the late 70s and early 80s, Canada started a policy where people could get together, ordinary people in society and sponsor a family to help them get settled in terms of refugee resettlement. And this was uh, sort of ramped up again uh, for the Syrian refugee crisis that I mentioned at the start when I was talking. So you can see here, there's, this is like basically the guidebook on how you get together with five of your friends um, to sponsor a refugee. Um, the picture there is from the New York Times where the New York Times profiled one of these uh, groups of five. Those are all the older people sitting in the back who sponsored that Syrian family who's sitting in the front. Um, the Canadian government has generally concluded that this is a pretty good program. There are problems because, you know, when you ask private citizens to do things, there are possibilities of abuse, there are possibilities of um, things going badly. But generally speaking, they have concluded that it's been pretty successful. Um, some people criticize it too as sort of a neoliberal way of offloading government responsibility down to private citizens. Um, but generally, the Canadian public is very supportive because if this is the way that they can help bring in more humanitarian migrants, um, a lot of community-based groups and religious-based groups have used this to, to help uh, refugees. The U.S. has just very recently, the Biden administration has very recently just decided to try a small pilot to do the same thing in the United States. So this is one of the very few cases of U.S. immigration policy um, learning from or trying to echo Canadian policy. One of the things that, um, sorry, one of the things that is interesting about these kind of programs is that just like with the nonprofits, it does this dual function when it comes to immigrant integration. It both helps immigrant integration because you have these people who are providing an apartment, who are helping people, you know, uh, get their kids into school, taking them to their appointments for medical care, et cetera, et cetera. But you are also basically building. Um, public opinion somewhat in favor of migration. Sometimes the Canadians who sponsor refugees have a poor experience, 
but generally speaking, they say they have a good experience. And so you're getting the general public involved in refugee resettlement, or if they themselves are not directly involved, they might have someone at church who's done this, or they know someone else who has been part of one of these support structures. And so this is a way in, in which you're really sort of um, spreading information, but also maybe support for your immigration policy by including civil society in what you're doing. I don't. So I actually do. go for it. Under the class, the pilot right now you can't. So you could sponsor a refugee, but they will be chosen through the UN, uh, you know, U.S. government system. But as of the fall, you will be able to target and select. The refugees, what they can do in Canada. In so Canada, I, you talk about that. I mean, they yeah, a lot of communities that target individuals. Yeah, and so in yeah. Canada, you can select. Like it's within, it's within some boundaries, but like there's a fair number of church groups of various religious backgrounds that are picking co-religionists, um, and so they will sponsor. There are also cases of family members actually bonding together with other friends to sponsor people. Um, so. It, you know, it's sort of assumed that it would be helpful probably for the new refugee to have a family member in the group. And so, yes, they're selecting. Um, some of the people I've spoken to who've done this, who have no connection, either religious or familial to, to refugees, they actually got dossiers, like especially when the, the, the 25,000, 35,000 came, they got dossiers and they could pick which, which group they um, wanted. Interestingly, and I haven't I haven't seen conclusive research on this, but when people had a choice, they often went with hard cases. Like they often went with families with lots of kids or where one kid was maybe having a disability or something. And I think it was because since they'd already invested in trying to do this, they really wanted to help. Um, but the Canadian government does not give to private um, sponsorship sort of the, the hardest cases in terms of people who have like a lot of medical issues, mental health or physical health. So if parents have a lot of challenges, they'll go through government sponsorship usually and, and more professional services. But yeah, there's choice. And there's, you know. It, it, it's a let's, there's a lot of research being done here and and. Um, I think one of the hard things is there is always failures and there's always going to be abuses in all programs and trying to measure the degree to which that is balanced off against some of the positives is, is the challenge right now. Um, so I would also say that another reason that the Canadian system has been working as, as long as, as far as you might think that support from public opinion is a good thing is because of Canada's multicultural and diversity policy. And I say this even after multiculturalism has really been under attack in Europe, um, and even in the Canadian case, um, people will often say it's a diversion, for example, from anti-racism efforts. Um, but the Canadian government and society in general have been um, really good, I would say, in reimagining Canadian national identity. And so here I want to take you back to like the 50s and 60s. And Canada in the 50s and 60s largely saw itself as two founding nations. And in fact, in the language of the day, they would see two founding races. Um, and it was the British and it was the French, right? It, this, was the, this was the big deal of confederation. The English and the French agreed and had confederation. And so if you read textbooks, parliamentary speeches from the day, Diefenbaker, it is about these two founding nations that made up Canada. You get into the 60s, the 60s are tumultuous everywhere, you know, in Canada, in the US, in France, everywhere. And so Canadians are trying to reimagine what they are, who they are. You have rising Quebecois independence separatism in Quebec. You have Canadians looking down to the United States at the civil rights movement. You have people saying, we don't want to be British anymore. You have anti-colonial movements all across the British Empire that have been going on for a few decades, but we're really sort of you know, going to their accumulation. And so Canadians are like, we don't want to be American. We don't want to be British. We have this Quebec separatism. What are we? Who are we? And, you know, sort of interestingly, this is when you have the Bilingualism and Biculturalism Commission. It comes out, it says Canada is going to be bilingual, French and English. 
But the Bicultural Commission kind of breaks down because people of other backgrounds and often European backgrounds, Ukrainians, Polish, et cetera, are like, wait a second, what about us? We're not in your English and French. Um, and then you sort of over time get a little bit more of an anti-racism effort. And so in 72, Pierre Trudeau, father to Justin, um, goes and says, you know, Canada is now henceforth going to be a multicultural country. Most accounts of what Pierre Trudeau was thinking about think that he just thought this was a little piece of fluff, you know, sounds nice. We're going to say it's multicultural. Maybe this is a way to put Quebec in its space because now it's not one of two founding nations. It's a little mosaic tile among many, many mosaic tiles. And so there's not much evidence that Pierre Trudeau was really into multiculturalism, but it takes on a life of its own as many people who are not English and not French start taking this up as a way for them to identify with Canada and a way for Canada to distinguish itself from being American or being um, British. And so this is why Canadians will you know, love to tell you, oh, the US is the melting pot, we are the mosaic. Uh, the reality is that that actually doesn't really bear out in survey evidence, but there's this imagining of who they are that is built in this new idea of Canadian nationalism. And so you can see this up on Canadian government websites, still are promoting multiculturalism, though nowhere near the heyday in the 80s and 90s. Um, and then if you go to the annual report, it's gonna tell you all these wonderful things about immigrants, like they contribute to an educated Canada, they're politically engaged, they're donors, they're generous. Um, you know, it, it sort of goes on and on. It's really almost a propaganda machine in terms of telling Canadians why immigration is so good. Um, and then just think, think about the difference in discourse then from these elite levels that both immigrants are absorbing, they want us, we're really cool people, but also Canadian born Canadians are absorbing in terms of like, this is the way to think about immigration. Um, now, I'm not saying that Canada is 1984 and they're just going to like listen to what Big Brother's telling, but there is sort of a consistent message of diversity as a strength and immigration is a good thing, which is different, say, than during the Trump administration. And this is actually being absorbed into Canadians' ideas of national identity. So this is from uh, Enveronics again. They ask regular questions about important Canadian identity symbols. Um, Canadians you know, love to talk about their health care, even if they don't find it always the best. Um, I think this is partially anti-Americanism. Um, because I think Canadians like to talk about their universal health care system, not so much for all the benefits, though there are real benefits, but to say, again, we're not American, like we have the universal health care system, you don't. Um, then you have the Charter of Rights and Values, uh, sorry, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and then you have uh, public education, RCMP. Notice multiculturalism is one of the identity aspects. About half uh, of the people who responded said that this was part, uh, an important symbol of Canadian identity, more than hockey. I always think that's interesting. I spent 10 years on the Canadian prairies in Saskatoon and watched a lot of hockey. And so it's, it's you know, surprising to me that multiculturalism comes in over hockey in terms of an important um, symbol of identity. If you then ask Canadians what they can be the most effective international role model on, they are really proud of their multiculturalism and their immigration. They really think they are the shining light in the world on this issue. So it has become a part of sort of national identity. So if you think of the social psychology of this, if you think you are an example to the world on multiculturalism and immigration, it's a little bit harder for you to be critical of immigration, not impossible, but you've really absorbed this as this is who we are, this is what we're part of. So I think another part of why Canadians are very positive on immigration is related to multicultural and diversity policy and how it's become part of national identity. The last thing, and this is where I really put on my political sociology hat, is because of all that positive information, all of that integration support, immigrants become citizens. And then once they become citizens, they can become politically engaged and they can vote, right? So in Canada, compared to the United States, um, the, the law on the books is not that different in naturalization. If you look at how many years you have to wait, what you have to show in terms of language or knowledge requirements, Canada and the United States have quite similar citizenship policies. But when you look at who actually becomes a citizen and how many people do, Canada has an outrageously high level of naturalization. 
Um, so this is from the OECD. So when you look at working age immigrants with at least 10 years of residence, you have over 90% who have become Canadian citizens. The comparable figure in the United States is about 60%. And so of the 20% of the population, 23% of the population that are foreign born, almost all of them become citizens and then they can be part of the political process. So you get this feedback loop. And it's not to say that immigrants can't be anti-immigrant. In fact, many, many immigrant communities, once they get to a country will be like, well, we were the good immigrants, but these new people are not so good. So it's not, it's not the case that all immigrants just knee jerk are in favor of immigration, but it is somewhat harder to be sort of hardcore anti-immigrant when you're looking at a voting age population that has many, many first generation and second generation immigrants. And in comparison in the United States, if you look at that foreign born percentage, remember it was only 13 and a half, percent of the population, and about half of them are um, naturalized. So this is working age with 10 years of residence. If you take the whole population, it's only about half are citizens. So you just have much less political weight. And then thinking about the geography, many of them will end up in places like San Francisco, New York, LA, et cetera. Um, so the politics of immigration become quite different between the two countries as well. Okay, so what I want you to take from what I've said so far is, why are Canadians positive on immigration, especially if we're thinking about immigration as maybe an economic or demographic policy choice? It's partially because there's control. It might partially because there's economic selection, but it goes way beyond that. So it's not just about border enforcement and immigration selection policy. It's also about the welcome that are given to immigrants in terms of integration support. It's about the discourse that is surrounding immigration in terms of diversity and multiculturalism policy. And then it's about getting people involved in the political system so they can advocate on their own behalf or the behalf of their community. Um, so we have to have a much broader view of immigrant systems and immigration. I'm going to end with some potential storm clouds on the horizon for the Canadian side, um, just because it's not going to be all raw, raw Canada. Um, so potential storm clouds, and this is things that you might have been reading about in the news. Um, Canadians, like I said, are pretty positive about immigration until they saw tens of thousands of people trying to cross between New York and Quebec at the Roxham border crossing. Um, so again, the sense of control, right? So as the number of asylum seekers crossing from New York into Quebec get going up and up and up, you heard the Quebec provincial government starting to say, whoa, this is coming, getting to be quite expensive and people more generally getting worried. Um, and so just very recently, Biden and Trudeau agreed to amend the safe third country agreement such that now Canada will not accept asylum seekers at um, these, these uh, sort of unmanned uh, border crossings, and they're gonna return them to the United States. So the US's policy of sending people back to Mexico, Canada's now gonna do the same thing vis-a-vis -vis the United States. This is now in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, a group of immigration and refugee groups has gone to the Supreme Court to say that the safe third country agreement is unconstitutional because the United States is not a safe third country. Um, and they started this process during the Trump administration when people were being detained in cages and such. Um, now it's a different administration, so I don't know if that's going to affect the Supreme Court decision, but the Supreme Court's supposed to be ruling on it in the next few months. So we'll see what happens. But Biden and Trudeau just struck this deal where Canada's again trying to control its borders by making this kind of agreement. Another potential storm cloud is that I think one of the things that has made Canada's system um, pretty successful is because many migrants to Canada uh, end up with permanent immigration uh, status. So remember all those pathways, like you can be an agricultural worker, you can end up as a permanent migrant, you can be a student, you can end up as a permanent migration or a permanent immigrant. Canada has increasingly over the last 15 years really shot up the number of temporary migrant workers. So previously it was always a small proportion of the total immigrant pool and now it's getting much, much bigger. And whenever you have temporary migrants, you might get undocumented migrants or people who overstay their visas, right? So the origins of the US undocumented uh, population in part is with the Bracero program after World War II. So during World War II and then after World War II, the US had a temporary migration program with Mexico and other countries to bring in immigrant labor for the railroads and especially agriculture. 
That program ends in 64. It is not replaced by anything similar. And so then you still have these circular migrants who are coming, but now no longer are able to get visas through temporary migration and become undocumented. And so that is one of the origins of the undocumented uh, sort of flow in the US. You can look to Germany for the same thing in terms of guest workers. Germany had all kinds of guest workers, was expecting the guest workers from Turkey, for example, to go back after the oil shock. They do not go back. You suddenly have an immigration issue. So Canada might start getting an undocumented immigration issue as these temporary workers um, start falling off visas. There were several online questions about that. The idea of, we looked at differences in Canadian and uh, US perceptions on immigration. Several people asked about the idea of the differences between the amount of undocumented and documented immigrants and whether or not that plays a role in being accepted of immigrants. Um, someone pointed out that if you're an undocumented immigrant, you can't naturalize and vote and things like that. So if you could maybe speak to some of that. Sure. So uh, the question was about um, the relative uh, number and then I guess sort of substantive importance of undocumented immigration in the United States and Canada. It is um, absolutely the case that there are far more undocumented immigrants in the US as a number and as a proportion of the total than in Canada. In the US, the estimate is somewhere between 10 to 11 million um, undocumented people. That's a lot. Um, in Canada, no one has a good estimate. Um, numbers range from you know, 10, 20,000 up to 500,000. Um, I've spoken to a number of people, no one thinks that they actually have the right number. Um, so certainly there's a much higher undocumented pro population in, in the US and yes, they can't vote. They can never become citizens under as an undocumented person. They would have to try to figure out another way to get legal status. Um, and so that does play a part in the politics, absolutely. And I think it also plays in a part in the politics to the extent that there's this feeling of lack of control, right? So this idea that we didn't ask for these people to come, they're here. Whereas in Canada, the government can say, well, we have you know, vetted people, we have chosen people. But even then, even if you go sort of beyond that and you ask um, Americans and Canadians about, say, you know, wh what is your preference in terms of permanent migration and sort of legal pathways, there's still somewhat of a difference. But I think it is very, very possible that um, the undocumented population in the United States has been used and demonized and, and racialized in a way to um, foment anti-immigrant feelings in some proportion of the population. Um, as a matter of proportion, even if you bring in the undocumented population into calculations of what is sort of the proportion or number of immigrants coming into the United States compared to Canada, Canada is still letting in somewhere between four to five times as many immigrants as a proportion of its population. So Canada, the newest, uh, the last uh, fiscal year was about 400,000. And so if you were to do the same, you know, 400,000 out of the population of Canada down to the US, you'd be talking about 4 million people approximately. And like last year, it was about a million people who came in under US immigration. Um, legally and then the undocumented population we are having a hard time estimating it but it's been basically stagnant for the last 15 years um and in fact if anything over the last 15 years net migration to mexico from the u.s has been higher than migration from mexico to the united states by mexican nationalists not nationals not by central americans or people from the caribbean um so you know the u.s to to get to canada's numbers would have to basically quadruple its system um so it's, it's not just that. And then interestingly, okay, this is, this is really recent. So for those of you in the audience from the Canadian American program, I just think this is fascinating. So ca Canadian public officials and immigration and refugee uh, in, the, in the ministry, they, they really impress me by how they try to be on top of the issues before the issues arise and how networked in they are to both advocates, but also academics. Um, this is a ministry that is always trying to manage, publicly manage both the policy, but also the public discourse about the policy. And so they have been hearing this warning for a while now, they know this, like, you know, the advocates and the academics have been saying, watch out, you have all these temporary migrants, you're going to get an undocumented immigration problem with visa overstayers. And so they've been listening. 
And they just started two years ago, actually, um, an amnesty program, but it's totally under the radar. And they're sort of doing it quietly to trying to figure out whether it could work. And so they worked with the construction union in Toronto to identify whether there are people who are out of status in the construction trades and trying to legalize them. And this goes back to the thing about like, we just don't know how many people who are out of status live in Canada. And so they were trying to figure this out and they got 500 people to apply to legalize their situation. And so they've moved them to permanent residency with their families. Um, and I find it interesting that you can find on the achievements page that the government is like celebrating their achievement of legalizing people. Now it's only 500, but it's very striking that I don't think we're there here. That's not where the conversation is here. It was in 1986. So remember back in 1986 with the Immigration and Reform and Control Act signed under Reagan, 3 million people got legal status in the United States through the last biggest amnesty that we've had in the US. But there's been like no conversation about that in the last 10, 10 years, ever since George Bush the second, like right before September 11th, there was a moment where the US and Mexico were about maybe to strike some kind of deal. Um, and then after 9-11, that just disappeared and has never really come back. Um, and then last thing, yes, there is a little bit of right-wing populism in Canada, itsy bitsy, teensy weensy. Um, so there has been, um, you know, there, there has been a populist party that has tried to rise in the Canadian system. Um, they only got 1.6% of the vote in 2019. They did get almost up to 5% of the vote in 2021, which um, really had some Canadian commentators worried. But in both elections, the leader of the party, Maxime Bernier, um, first of all, he lost his seat in the first one. So he was a member of the Conservative Party. He created his own party. He lost his seat and he never regained it in 2021, even though their vote share went up 5%. So, you know, there are little grumblings of sort of the, the, the uh, anti-immigrant populism um, that you've seen elsewhere. But so far, at least in Canada, it hasn't really um, extended very far. Um, and I'm going to end there. Thank you. still on. It looked like it went to sleep, but I think it's still working. Well, thank you very much, Irene. Uh, very interesting uh, talk. Um, we have maybe 10 minutes or so for, for more discussion. Um, so if there are questions in the room, I'm going to crawl into kind of the middle here so I can hand you the microphone uh, so we don't have to keep repeating questions for the folks on Zoom. And Jason's going to monitor what comes in that way and have a little discussion. Thank you so much. This is really interesting. Um, I have many questions as I usually do. Um, I was told earlier at a previous seminar, I might need to get cut off. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm curious um, if you could speak to, you know, it's interesting to um, hear about the kind of Canadian national identity. And obviously you're talking about partisanship in the United States and how that's kind of contributing. You know, we see this these opinions about immigration um, having to do it with, with partisanship. I'm wonder I'm wondering what your thoughts are on kind of the the national identity in the United States around um, the role of immigration and national identity and and maybe the different views of national identity and how it fits in. And if you could speak to that briefly. Yeah, sure. Um, so as as you saw, I didn't do a single regression or a statistic here because I thought it was a general audience. But we've actually I could give you some statistics and regressions. Um, We've been doing, I and some collaborators have been doing a series of survey experiments to figure out whether framing immigration with different types of ways of understanding immigration might change public opinion. Um, and so we looked, for example, if you use economic arguments, if you say to, we use California voters. So if you say to California voters, you know, some people say immigrants are good for the economy. Other people say they take jobs. Do you think we should legalize our 10 million, 11 million undocumented immigrants? Economic arguments do not change people's opinions. So even if you try to shift their opinions by making economic arguments, doesn't do anything. Interestingly, and I would say counterintuitively for me, priming them with an appeal to American values, undefined, makes them more generous. 
So we, we have a prime where we go, some people, uh, let me think, how was the wording exactly? I'm gonna get the wording wrong, but like thinking about American values, you know, would you, et cetera, et cetera. When you, when you prime American values, people are more likely to say that there's a problem if a woman doesn't have enough to eat and you know, you might be more open to giving food stamps, for example. Um, and they're more likely to think that um, immigrants deserve some kind of assistance. And we found that that's the case even when you prime American values with people who are self-identified conservatives. Um, now, we had in these surveys an open-ended question about what do you mean by American values, because we did not define it. And the people who are more conservative or um, we had both ideology and partisanship, but like for the ideology one from a scale of one to seven, you know, sort of progressive conservative, the conservatives will say more about, you know, American values are the family, religion, um, hard work, uh, those kind of things. And progressives in California might say more, it's about taking care of each other, giving health care, um, name your progressive causes. So there might be differences, but both of them are reacting effectively or emotionally to this appeal to American values, but in the same direction in terms of being more open to immigrant appeals. And I did not expect that. I expected it to go, I expected that some people who might be conservative if they were primed with American values would become more anti-immigrant. And that is not what we found. And then we've just replicated in the last two years, the same experiment in Canada. So we make an appeal to Canadian values and then we provide some hardship scenarios and it's the same thing in Canada. So an appeal to Canadian values undefined um, makes people more willing to be generous to immigrants in social rights and civil rights. Um, so I don't, so what I find interesting is I'm not sure if it's in that case, there's something maybe about the content in the Canadian case, because that's what I just argued, but there's something also affect, affective about an appeal to values and the nation and us as a community that might make people more welcoming to immigrants, which again, I wasn't expecting and I still don't quite understand because when you see all of the populist parties in Europe and elsewhere, they're using nationalism and patriotism in a very different way. So I, I don't quite yet understand how that works. I will say it was California voters. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know how those survey experiments would go somewhere else. So on your um, presentation, you compared the US and Canada to other countries as a percentage of foreign born population. And uh, Tony on Zoom is curious about what how the we might draw different or similar conclusions about views of immigration in the two countries if we compared the change in that percentage over time in those countries versus how they compare to other countries. Okay, so in terms of change over time, the proportion of foreign born people in the United States has changed more rapidly than in Canada. Um, in terms of foreign born. So um, in the United States, there was an open door policy on immigration through basically much of the 19th century. The US starts shutting the door in the 1870s, but really in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act. And then from 1882 to the 1920s, the US keeps shutting the door progressively across a racial logic. So it's first against the Chinese, then the Japanese, then anyone from Asia, and then from most European countries, any Eastern and Southern European country. So that by the mid twenties, the US is actually no longer an immigrant nation. There's very, very few people who can come in under US immigration law by the twenties. And this continues all the way to 1965. So what's really interesting is in 1970, according to the census, less than 5% of the US population was foreign born. So the US was no longer an immigrant nation by 1970 because there just hadn't been very many immigrants. So going from five to 13% is then not quite a threefold increase, but you know, quite a bit of increase. Canada has a racially selective policy. It does a head tax against Chinese immigrants, tries to shut the door against Indian immigrants, also shuts the door against Japanese immigrants. It's, it's sort of following the same story as the United States. 
but does not shut the door against European immigrants, except unfortunately for people fleeing World War II who are of Jewish faith. Canada lets in almost nobody of Jewish faith during World War II. It's really a black mark against the Canadian government and Canadian society. Um, but right after World War II, opens the door to British war brides, the Dutch, Hungarians. So there's actually quite a lot of European migration right after World War II. So Canada, even though it's at about 20, 23%, it never dropped down that far. I'm I can't remember exactly what it was in 50, but I'm thinking, I'm trying to, I'm thinking it's like 14, 15%. I'm not entirely sure. But the, 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 the proportion change is not as much. So Canada has been more immigrant. So potentially, I think one part of the story is that all those European immigrants have been potentially a lobbying force to keep immigration open. I don't think that was necessarily self-evident because I do think that there were all kinds of interesting racial politics where you could imagine Europeans would be no more interested in diversifying the immigrant uh, makeup um, than other countries, but th that's different. So if you're worried, like if, if rate of change might be driving anti-immigrant attitudes, then in that way, the US has had a more rapid rate of change over the last little bit than Canada has, but it has not had the same rapid rate of change as some of the European countries I spoke about, Spain, Ireland, um, Italy. They've had, basically they've gone from emigration countries, right? Like Ireland, Italy, sending millions of people to the United States. After World War II, they're reconstructing. There's no immigration at all. It's still emigration. People are leaving those countries in droves. And then it's really over the last 20 or 30 years that suddenly they have migrants. And so if anything, rate of change is higher in places like Italy, Spain, and um, Ireland. And interesting, like I said, Spain and Ireland just have not had the same anti-immigrant politics. I don't know enough about those two countries to comment on why, but I think it's not just Canada. There's, there's something interesting going on elsewhere. Thanks uh, very much. That was fabulous and, and very persuasive. So you're a sociologist. We've got a lot of smart economists in the room. Um, I'm going to I'm going to throw in a little political science. Sure. So when you look at, at Canada and the United States on immigration, the Canadians have a parliamentary system. Yep. Generally have majorities. They've been able to play with their immigration policy a lot. Like you pointed out all those programs, the sort of experimental economic selection programs here in the United States. Congress largely controls immigration policy, certainly controls the selection system hasn't been a significant reform in the selection system since 1990. Mm -hmm. To what extent is governmental failure part of the answer to the, the difference between Canada and the United States on public attitudes? Um, I think certainly the two government systems have amplified and in fact, maybe exacerbated the, the public policy differences. So I do not want you to come from this lecture thinking, politics is completely, and policy in particular, is driven by public opinion. I'm, I'm not so sure that that's even at all the case. Um, I do think that it, it plays part of it, but I actually think government institutions are a huge part of the story. Um, and it's a huge part of the story for multiple reasons. One of the reasons is in the Canadian case, elections matter in that um, people are voted out of office regularly, right? So every time there's a federal election, there are not that many safe seats in Canada. There is actual real change in who is elected and incumbency does not guarantee you re-election. And so the, the incumbency rate in the US, as you know, is insane, right? So there's no sort of check on what people do because whoever's there is gonna get re-elected even if they are more older, even if they might have some cognitive difficulties, et cetera, et cetera. They just, <laughs> they just get reelected. Um, and so one of the things that does happen is in the Canadian context, a lot of the, the ridings that are important to win the parliamentary majority are in big cities like Toronto and Vancouver. Toronto and Vancouver are both basically 50% foreign born, I think by now, um, or close to. And so you have all of these urban voters in ridings that matter where they can flip and so they have power. Um, and I think one of the interesting things in the Canadian system in terms of being sensitive is um, I spent 10 years in Saskatoon. So I lived in Saskatoon from eight to 18, my formative years in the prairies. 
And so I was in Saskatoon when the Reform Party started in Alberta, right? So this was the Western protest movement, um, a conservative movement. The very first Reform Party uh, manifesto or blue book was going to get rid of multiculturalism. It said that we had to shut down immigration because it was changing the ethnic makeup of Canada too quickly, explicitly in the 80s, was saying, no, there's too many non-white people coming in. Um, and this was what the party was founded on. You fast forward just a few years when finally they're actually competitive for national election and potentially winning the federal government. You have Stephen Harper who becomes the new conservative party and all of that gets dropped away because there's no way you're gonna win a majority of ridings across Canada if you can't get the big urban centers like Toronto and Vancouver. And so the politics are such that they had to get rid of multi, like we're going to get rid of multiculturalism that had to drop. They became very pro-immigration from a business perspective. And then once the conservatives came into power, Jason Kenney, who was the minister of immigration, he was one of the most pro immigrant sort of multiculturalism he would he would joke that he gained like 40 pounds from going to all these ethnic community events um you know like like the politics of 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 canada and the politics of immigration are such that even a party that was founded on being sort of profoundly worried about immigration and diversity had to change in order to win office and in the in the u.s system it's yeah it's government failure to the sense that there's sclerosis like it, there's and then, you know, then we can get into like the Senate and like which, you know, where are the immigrants, how many senators actually have, you know, have more than 13% of their, their state population that's immigrant, et cetera. Yes, there's part of that. Another difference too between the two systems is the Canadian parliamentary system, as I sort of alluded to, the, the bureaucrats, the public servants who run uh, the policy in immigration are pretty impressive people generally. Um, very well educated, uh, read a lot of like, you know, academic literature, do a lot of analyses. Um, and they really have a lot to say about policy. I mean, ultimately it's cabinet who decides and it's a political decision, but the sort of mid-level bureaucracy in the Canadian civil service has a lot to say and is very thoughtful and it's pretty diverse too. And so you have sort of people from that immigrant diversity analyzing statistics and making recommendations. And in the US, that whole system is so much more politicized. Um, you know, people in DHS don't have much to say if they're career civil servants. Thanks, Irene. Uh, I'm not an economist nor a sociologist, but um, I'm the son of an immigrant. And uh, I wondered if there's any, um, differences, but generational differences on uh, favor, whether they favor immigration or not. Uh, is that as important as partisanship, perhaps? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's the empirical answer to your question is hard to get because most of our surveys do not ask people the um, place of birth of parents. And so when we do surveys to figure out what immigrants think about things, we use place of birth. So like, where were you born? And then you have like, you know, like the immigrants think this, and then we know it. It's actually really hard in most surveys to figure out what the second generation thinks because we don't ask. We don't say like, you know, was your mother or father born in another country? So the short answer is, I don't really know very well. In the Canadian case, because the numbers are pretty high, in a, if you get a big survey, like a 4,000, 5,000 person survey, you know, you get 20% immigrant, there's about 20% second generation, you can usually get an N high enough to look at it. Second generation tends to be pretty pro-immigrant. The US, it's much harder to, to figure out. And so I, I don't feel like I can speak to it. I would guess sociologically that um, they, I don't know. I don't even know if I want to guess. Um, I think at this point, partisanship is drive. Like, like if, if you had to put like coefficients on what is going to predict my attitudes on immigration, partisanship is by far the biggest thing. Now, of course, you can ask me like, well, is it the case that people who are foreign born are more likely to support the Democratic Party versus the Republican Party? Yes. And so then immigration goes through to partisanship, but it's really partisanship right now. I'm punting on that one a little bit. <laughs>
Right, we have another Zoom question here. So an anonymous uh, Zoom viewer would like to know, earlier you mentioned that people single out Alberta and Quebec. They're curious maybe why and what that means for uh, their views on immigration. Sure. Um, so in the Canadian context, at least colloquially, Alberta is considered the Texas of Canada in terms of its political economy, you know, it's oil, ranching, um, and then also its attitudes because Alberta was the place that the Reform Party um, was founded. And so to the extent that um, there is a sense that there's a heartland of more conservative thought, it would be Alberta. And, you know, until very recently, you know, all of the provincial governments were right of center. Uh, there's been one notable exception. But um, it's seen as, as a more conservative place. So when people talk about Alberta, it's like trying to get to one end of the spectrum in terms of political views. But actually, if you look around immigration issues, Alberta is not that different from a lot of other places. Um, and then Quebec on the other end is, is related to you know, perennial Canadian questions around the place of uh, Quebec in Confederation, the place of Francophones in the Canadian nation state or state. Um, and so Quebec is often held up as, as an exception. Partially too in Quebec, there's been much more pushback against the language of multiculturalism. Um, I think there's a fair proportion of the population that does see multiculturalism as a way of undermining the revendication, uh, the, the claims of the, the, the Quebec uh, people and, and the Quebecois nation. Um, and so there's more ambivalence in terms of multiculturalism. So the word uh, used in Quebec is interculturalism, as many of you probably know. And interculturalism has a slightly more assimilatory um, element to it. So it's like, yes, we like diversity, but everyone has to come to the French fact and learn French. Um, and the Francophones will tell you, well, that's what English Canada does too, because it wants everyone to speak English, but it doesn't have to do anything because English is the global language, so people do it anyway. So there, there's a little bit of a debate there, but Quebec is considered another outlier, and Quebec has also been more in the news because it has been much more public, the government of Quebec, around um, religious accommodation and has taken more of a French Republican approach to it, trying to remove religion from public life. Other people would say that they're being more religiously intolerant tolerant. Um, and so that that's often held up as an other place to look. But there's some really interesting research by Antoine Bilado, who's at Concordia, that shows that actually, if you look at more direct measures of acceptance of diversity, acceptance of immigration, etc., Quebec actually doesn't look much different from other provinces either. Um, so there's this public perception. And then when you actually look at data, there's not huge regional differences, not not in any significant way. Government yeah, that's true. So for those of you who don't know, um, back in the early 1990s, okay, let me take a step back. Um, in, in Canada, in the constitution, um, immigration um, is uh, somewhat of a divided power um, between the provinces and, and the federal government. Um, in the U.S., the, the Supreme Court has said that immigration is a plenary power of the federal government. And so, for example, when Arizona or California tried to do things related to immigration, the courts would strike it down and say, no, you're not allowed to do things on immigration. Immigration's only for Congress and the federal government. In the Canadian context, there's more of a partnership. And even though, I can't remember if it's Section 93 or 94, one of them has sort of immigration to the federal government. But they, in the early 90s, made agreements with Quebec so that Quebec could actually select its own migrants in the economic stream. Um, and so Quebec gives more points and privileges francophone immigrants as an economic selection uh, priority. Now, what's interesting about what happened with Quebec is that after that, a lot of other provinces all sort of said, hey, we want our own immigration policy too, or we want to have a, you know, a say to this. So that's where the provincial nominee program comes in. So various different provinces can nominate people who want to go to their province to sort of get fast tracked through the system. And so like if Manitoba says, we really need construction workers, people who have these kind of skills, then they can be nominated by the provincial government and go through the immigration system. The thing that I find fascinating about the Canadian case is that all of the provinces, maybe with the exception of Ontario, 
are all trying to do their own immigration systems and all of them want immigrants. Like there's, there's, it's not like in the United States where you have states like purposely saying, we don't want immigrants, you know, we don't want, we want to shut the border or we don't want people coming to our state. In the Canadian case, they're all sort of competing against each other to get more immigrants. And the only one that doesn't is Ontario, but that's because most immigrants go to Ontario. So they really don't have to do anything. All right. Well, I think we've kind of reached the end of our time. If you could join me again in thanking Irene for a wonderful, wonderful talk. And then I just wanted to sign off uh, from all of us at Western Washington University and the Economics Department. We want to thank you for joining us today. Um, we want to again thank the Department of Sociology, the Center for Canadian American Studies, the Border Policy Research Institute, and the Alumni Association for their partnership. And finally, we'd like to thank all of you for attending, for supporting the activities of the Paul Storer Memorial Fund. The recording of this webinar is going to be emailed out in the next few days, so keep an eye on your email for a link to that, and I hope you have a great evening. Thanks for coming.